I have a little bit of housekeeping before I do my story. So when I was coming here tonight, I got an email from an old friend who I've known forever saying that he was going to be here. I was thrilled that he was going to be here. This is somebody who I really like and admire and I've known forever. And I came here and he was here and I went to talk to him for a bit. And then as I was leaving and saying goodbye to him and his lovely wife, I reached and I knocked over a glass of red wine onto his lap and his clothing. So I was thinking after I did that, how do you make up for something like that? So then I thought I should give him a public apology. So what I'm going to do is just take a second and email him. It's a public apology and a pun because of where we are. So I'm going to give him a public laugh apology. Exactly. Hilarious. So let me just send him an apology right now. Let's see. I've, pre -prepared, I've prepared it in advance. It's in draft. And I'm going to send it right now. Is that him calling? OK. That's the apology. And then the only thing better than a public apology is a public spectacle. All right. So the name of this story is Celebrity X or There is a Chicken in This Story. It has four parts. Part one. This story starts on, the, on a day I saw a guy trip and fall. I've seen people trip and fall more than once, but this time was special. This guy was hurrying across the street in Midtown and he got his feet tangled up and he went face forward and then somehow executed a perfect somersault and came right back, sprang right back up onto his feet. I remember thinking at the time that it would be hard to forget. It turns out I was right because this was 20 years ago, something like that. I know the time roughly because it's around the time that a friend of mine made this joke where he said that Chuck Berry's song Memphis was directed by M. Night Shyamalan because it has a twist ending. <laughs> I, it's not a good joke, it's a thinker, but I remember thinking about it that day and thinking, that's kind of something, but also kind of, I don't know, mannered, whatever. So thinking about that joke, saw this guy, guy went over. That day I was on my way to a meeting with a publisher. I had met this guy a couple years before and he was short and intense and very skinny when I first met him. And then he put on some weight and then he put on the rest of it. <laughs> and carrying all of this extra weight made him grumpy and that day that I was going to meet with him, I made him grumpier. We had been talking about a biography of a popular funk star at the time. This artist was among the most brilliant creators of any popular art form of his or any other generation, somebody who I revered. And I had met this publisher at a party and said, I'm thinking of writing a biography of this musician. And he brightened to this idea. And we were getting along famously. It wasn't agented. It was just, I don't know, we were just talking about it. But I had come to his office that day with bad news. My research into this person's life, this star's life, had been going very well, which doesn't seem like bad news, maybe, on the face of it. But it had been going so well that I couldn't go on with the project. What had happened is that as I started to research, and I, this was back in the Sixth Sense days, so it was microfiche and libraries and that kind of thing, and I found out things that I did not like or things that upset me about this particular celebrity. They weren't about his copious drug use, I was okay with that. They weren't about his prickly personality. I was okay with that. There were other things that started to unnerve me. And I had gone to his office that day to tell him that I didn't think that I was a biographer. I didn't really want to do it. My goal was to uplift this person and his life rather than drag him down into muck, self-made muck, admittedly. But I didn't want to drag him into the muck. So he was sitting down and he said, why are you stopping? And I said, well, I found out some unsavory things. And he said, why are you stopping? And I said, I found out some unsavory things. And he looked at me again. And he said, why, why are you stopping? And at that point, the conversation had deteriorated into a loop. And he got up. He realized we were going nowhere. So I went somewhere. I went out of his office. And that was that. Part two. I felt bad after that meeting. Uh, I felt like I failed to do something, largely because I had. And up to that point, I had been publishing mostly fiction. 
So as I sat with that failure over the months and the year or so, I, I thought, oh, I have a good idea. So the good idea I had was to recast that failed biography as a novel. And I used this character's life, this person's life, as the foundation for a character. I built in composites, I pulled in other figures, I worked around it, I fictionalized a lot of place and time and plot, but it was in spirit the biography that had never happened. I finalized it, I found a publisher, it came out, it made the rounds. Part three. One day about four and a half months after that, I got a call from a number that looked like the number of the publisher whose office I had visited that day that I abandoned the biography, but it wasn't. It was started the same, ended differently. Uh, this, I, I picked up the call and it turned out it was a different editor in the same company and he had read the novel and something about it put him in mind of what he said was a quote, unrelated, related project. And it turned out, that was intriguing enough for me to continue the call, and it turned out that he wanted me to collaborate with a famous person on this famous person's memoir. Different person. The idea did not appeal to me immediately. I had been writing mostly fiction, but when I thought about it, I realized quickly that there were other considerations. My wife and I had two children, and they had learned to walk and to read, and at some point they went off to little kids' school, and there was at least some chance, I thought, that they would one day attend an institution of higher learning. And that meant rubbing fingers together. Oh, actually, wait, I'm not supposed to say it. I'm supposed to just do it, wait. That meant... <laughs> so you know the movie The Gold Rush by Charlie Chaplin. He plays this Alaskan prospector and he is braving a brutal winter. And he's in a cabin with this other prospector named Big Jim. And Big Jim is starving, and at some point he looks over and sees Chaplin, who's playing the little tramp character, and he hallucinates him as a giant chicken, uh, a potential meal for him. That's a version of what happens when you have children who are approaching college age. <laughs> Though there's a key difference. You do not see each child as a giant chicken that you might eat. You see each child as a giant chicken that might eat you. <laughs> and this is a disconcerting feeling that's made more disconcerting if you check your bank account and you find that you do not have enough chicken feed. So for this reason, fiction receded and other kinds of writing came to the fore, including this unrelated, related collaboration that I had been pitched by this editor who was not the first editor. I, I did that and after, and I, you know, I liked it. And after that, I did other projects as well. I worked with other singers, I worked with actors, I worked with comedians. And what I found, which was interesting, is that it was liberating in a sense. Um, it was therapeutic for them to tell their life stories and therapeutic for me because I got to listen to them. And all of this kind of talking and thinking flew away. I could hear about the world that they had inhabited and in many cases the worlds that they had changed without spending too much time reflecting on my own world, which was a place that felt, if not always malignant, rarely benign. So I continued to do these kinds of projects and uh, the career shifted. Part four. Uh, years passed as these other collaborations happened and then at one point one of the collaborations I was asked to do was with a guy who had been a close friend of that initial celebrity, Celebrity X, the one who I had pitched the biography on years before. We talked about this celebrity during the course of working on this other book frequently. He had been a close friend, a collaborator, an inspiration to the person I was working with. And I was timid at first, then more timid, then less timid, then more timid again, but eventually I worked up the courage to ask him if he might make an introduction. And he was immediately enthusiastic. I'll hook you up, he said, and then he did. So I met this celebrity, Celebrity X, and the people around him. And I discovered that he did want to write his life story. He really wanted to write a memoir. There was a wrinkle. At the time, he was living a lifestyle that was not really conducive to working with me or anyone. He had a drug problem, which meant that most of his days were spent kind of in short-term plays for cash. Uh, I, would, I tried to start to create a work schedule, and he or his people would say, yeah, you can have a conversation for $1,000. And then I would explain, no, that's not really 
how it works, and then they would say, well, then it's not going to work. And we went on like that for years. It was a, uh, an interesting and painful dance that I was losing. If you can, I guess you can lose a dance. I did. So then one day, a number of years passed, and one day my phone rang, and a new person was on the phone. And she introduced herself as the manager of Celebrity X, close friend of his and manager. And she delivered an important piece of news, which was that the wrinkle had been ironed out. He was, after years and years of addiction, on his way to getting clean. And that meant for him a new attitude and a new approach to things. And she also was there at his side. And she assured me that he understood what the process would require and that she would help manage his schedule. And the mere fact that she was using words like process and schedule, that changed everything. And I was all in. And I remember going to my wife and saying, I think it's really going to happen. And she had heard me say that way too many times for her marriage to have survived that. But this time I was, uh, turns out I was right. And so I helped him write his life story. And it was a transformative experience in a lot of ways. He was a brilliant person. He is a brilliant person. Also a very complicated person. Conversations with him were rewarding. He didn't shy away from all of the dark things that I had shied away from earlier because, I don't know, he's braver and it was his life. Over the course of working on this project, he got to sort of tell and write his life story. And it also, in one interesting way, rewrote my own life story. So remember at the beginning of this, right after I threw the wine on myself, I was talking about a guy who tripped in the street. Uh, what happened to me over the course of writing this book was like that, only slower. I felt like I had tumbled, long turn, back up. And then also remember when I had that friend who had that joke that M. Night Shyamalan directed Chuck Berry's Memphis because it had a twist ending? Well, that happened to me too, as it turned out, only less elegantly. The, the way that this story ended was that what it, uh, I had failed to write this biography. I had retooled it as a novel. I had sent it out into the world. I had watched it uh, bring me into contact with a new kind of work and new people. And then eventually watched with kind of a disbelief almost as it brought me into contact with the subject of that original abandoned biography who, as it turned out in the intervening years, had developed a need for the new kind of work that I was now doing. So when I was first invited to tonight's event, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And then I said, what's the theme? And they said, oh, it's what goes around. And it was such a perfect fit that I assumed that it was a prank. <laughs> so thank you, pranksters. <laughs>